If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. George Orwell. Before we get started, I wanted to make a few things very clear. First, I am not an attorney, and nothing in this video is meant or intended to be legal advice. And I am not advocating filing any sort of legal action against any organization or individuals associated with any organization mentioned in this video. The statements in this video are my personal opinions, provided exclusively for entertainment purposes, and any arguments presented are merely for commentary, hypothetical intellectual exercise, and hypothetical conversational value only. Now, that out of the way, let's talk. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion surrounding the ongoing concerns that social media companies are unethically acting in bad faith. There are an increasing number of allegations that these companies are defrauding advertisers, discriminating against their employees, and discriminating against content creators whose individual efforts contribute directly to these companies' vast profits and financial success. For purposes of this conversation, and the hypothetical thought experiment discussion that follows afterwards. The only examples we'll be using are YouTube and its original parent company, Google, now restructured and known as Alphabet. On June 6, 2016, TechCrunch reported that Google lost its bid to get the U.S. Supreme Court to throw out a class action lawsuit against it. TechCrunch states, Those advertisers are alleging that by not informing them that ads purchased through that company's AdWords program might appear on error pages or park domains, Google misled them about where their ads would be placed, and they're seeking a refund on their payments. The suit was filed back in 2008 and covers advertising runs between 2004 and 2008. Once Google lost, rather than go to trial on the merits of the allegations, they chose to pay a settlement. On April 19, 2017, SiliconBeat.com reports, Google has struck a deal to settle a class action lawsuit for $22.5 million in a dispute that arose from disappointments regarding the placement of advertisements. This case alleges that Google failed to disclose to its AdWords customers that it placed ads on websites known as park domains and error pages. The lawsuit alleges that this conduct violated California laws against unfair competition and false advertising. Park domains are websites that aren't fully developed or are completely undeveloped and have little or no content. Then, a few months later, on December 13, 2017, Business Insider reported, a web advertising company named AdTrader whose staff surreptitiously recorded a phone conversation with a Google executive, claims in a class action lawsuit, Google does not refund money to advertisers when it discovers that those advertisers have spent money on fraudulent or invalid clicks. If the suit is successful, it could put Alphabet, Google's parent company, under pressure to repay tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to advertisers whose money was spent on websites that Google later deemed broke its rules. Then a few days later, on December 20th, 2017, Business Insider further reported that Bulletin Marketing was suing Google as well. They state, Google has again been sued in the U.S. federal court by a web publisher alleging that the search giant does not refund advertisers when it discovers that they have spent money on invalid clicks and instead wrongly retains the money for itself. The suit is at least the fourth in a string against Alphabet's Google search unit making similar allegations. One case won a ruling granting it class action status in July of this year. The complaint, filed in the Northern District of California on Wednesday, comes from a New Hampshire company, Bulletin Marketing, which claims that Google took more than a quarter of million dollars in ad fees without explanation in violation of Google's agreement with Bulletin. Upon spotting a violation of its rules, Google closed Bulletin's entire account. Bulletin is arguing that some, possibly most, of the money in that account must have been earned from legitimate clicks, and therefore, Google has simply kept the money for itself that was legitimately earned by Bulletin. However, the legal controversies didn't stop there. Even full-time Google employees also became extremely concerned with Google's behavior. In December 2016, BGR.com reported that an anonymous Google employee filed a lawsuit in San Francisco County Superior Court, and they state, a new and somewhat bizarre lawsuit filed against Google accuses a search giant of running an internal spying program and forcing employees to adhere to illegal confidentiality agreements, policies, guidelines, and practices. The lawsuit was filed earlier this week by an anonymous product manager. The suit claims that Google's employment agreements expressly prohibit Google personnel from reporting illegal conduct they may have witnessed or even bringing to light potentially dangerous product defects. 
The complaint alleges that Google discourages the aforementioned type of whistleblowing activities because such statements might ultimately resurface during legal proceedings. Then we fast forward to 2017. Google fired James Damore for authoring a memo discussing the scientifically proven differences between men and women. On January 8, 2018, Damore filed an anti-discrimination class action lawsuit. TechCrunch reports, the lawsuit filed by a Dillon Law Group says it aims to represent all employees of Google who have been discriminated against due to their perceived conservative political views by Google, due to their male gender by Google, and due to their Caucasian race by Google. More specifically, it accuses Google of singling out, mistreating, and systemically punishing and terminating employees who expressed views deviating from the majority view on political subjects raised in the workplace and relevant to Google's employment policies and businesses, such as diversity hiring policies, bias sensitivities, and social justice. Demore isn't holding back any punches here. According to his filing, Google employs illegal hiring quotas to fill its desired percentages of women and favored minority candidates, and openly shames managers of business units who fail to meet their quotas. In the process, openly denigrating males and Caucasian employees as less favored than others. The suit also claims that the numerical presence of women celebrated at Google was based solely due to their gender, while the presence of Caucasians and males was mocked with boos during company-wide weekly meetings. Then, on March 2, 2018, The Verge reported about Arn Wilberg's lawsuit against YouTube. They state, A former YouTube employee has sued Google for allegedly pressuring recruiters to only look for female, black, and Hispanic or Latinx applicants. Arn Wilberg, who spent nine years working at Google, filed a discrimination suit in January and the Wall Street Journal reported its existence today. Wilberg's lawsuit targets Google and 25 unnamed Google employees who allegedly enforced discriminating hiring rules, quoting a number of emails and other documents. It claims that for several quarters, Google would only hire people from historically underrepresented groups for technical positions. In one hiring round, the team was allegedly instructed to cancel all software engineering interviews with non-diverse applicants below a certain experience level and to purge entirely any applications by non-diverse employees from the hiring pipeline. California labor law prohibits refusing to hire employees based on characteristics like race and gender. However, Google's legal controversies got worse when content creators started expressing concerns about Google's YouTube platform. Law.com reports about YouTube content creator Zombie Go Boom's lawsuit from October 2017. The lawsuit was filed last October by the producers of the Zombie Go Boom YouTube channel, described by its creators as a live-action zombie series that is essentially a combination of Mythbusters and The Walking Dead. It sought to represent a class of other filmmakers who were financially impacted by YouTube's ad changes. Represented by attorneys at the law offices of Todd M. Freeman in Los Angeles, the Zombie Go Boom producers allege that their ad revenue dropped dramatically, from about $300 to $500 per day to $20 to $40 per day after YouTube altered its AdSense algorithm. U.S. District Judge Edward Chen of the Northern District of California, in an order granting YouTube's motion to dismiss the case with prejudice, agreed with the company that its standard agreement with content providers gives YouTube full discretion about whether to display ads next to posted videos at all. Chen also rejected arguments by the plaintiffs that those provisions in the contract should be declared invalid because they make the agreement illusory or breach the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing under California law. While the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing may be applied where contract terms are silent, Chen wrote, its application to contradict an express term of a contract is narrowly circumscribed. In other words, the judge didn't care whether or not Google acted in bad faith. Then, on October 23, 2017, YouTube content creator Prager University sued Google and YouTube. The Daily Signal reports, Prager University, a conservative nonprofit that creates educational videos, is suing Google for allegedly discriminating against the digital media organization for its fairly moderate ideological slant. Specifically, Prager is accusing YouTube, which is owned by Google parent company Alphabet, of restricting or demonetizing videos, even though they all appear to be innocuous and compliant with the platform's rules. Now that we have a primer on the many legal controversies surrounding Google and YouTube, let's conduct a hypothetical thought experiment and discuss other potential legal issues that may not have been addressed in any of the above-mentioned lawsuits and controversies surrounding them. With that in mind, let's start out with communication in the online public square. Wikipedia defines a digital public square as follows. 
A digital public square is a user-driven website that relies on user-generated content created by a group of people with a common interest in a specific community. At its most basic, a digital public square represents an evolution in how people discover, read, and share news, information, and content. Users, content providers, share the common goal of informing and becoming more informed about a shared geographic community or a community of ideas. Modeled after the traditional public square, where townspeople would gather to exchange views, a digital public square provides a virtual platform for the exploration of issues and the sharing of ideas, creativity, and opinions while developing solutions to a community's challenges. A thriving digital public square has a rich content stream that may include video footage of community events and an interactive community record of nonprofit news and resources. The digital public square offers a platform for dialogue and encourages people to connect in a virtual setting to establish relationships that can affect social change. I'll explain why this is important shortly, but before I do, it's important to include one more nugget of knowledge in our little thought experiment. On June 19, 2017, the United States Supreme Court ruled on a free speech case out of North Carolina, Packingham versus North Carolina. Their unanimous ruling states, in pertinent part, a fundamental principle of the First Amendment is that all persons have access to places where they can speak and listen, and then, after reflection, speak and listen once more. The court has sought to protect the right to speak in this spatial context. A basic rule, for example, is that a street or a park is a quintessential forum for the exercise of First Amendment rights. Even in the modern era, these places are still essential venues for public gatherings to celebrate some views, to protest others, or simply to learn and inquire. While in the past there may have been difficulty in identifying the most important places in a spatial sense for the exchange of views, today the answer is clear. It is cyberspace. The vast democratic forums of the internet in general, and social media in particular. Seven in ten American adults use at least one internet social networking service. One of the most popular of these sites is Facebook, the site used by Petitioner leading to his conviction in this case. According to sources cited to the court in this case, Facebook has 1.79 billion active users. This is about three times the population of North America. Social media offers relatively unlimited, low-cost capacity for communication of all kinds. On Facebook, for example, users can debate religion and politics with their friends and neighbors or share vacation photos. On LinkedIn, users can look for work, advertise for employees, or review tips on entrepreneurship. And on Twitter, users can petition their elected representatives and otherwise engage with them in a direct manner. Indeed, governors in all 50 states and almost every member of Congress have set up accounts for this purpose. In short, social media users employ these websites to engage in a wide array of protected First Amendment activity on topics as diverse as human thought. The nature of a revolution in thought can be that, in its early stages, even its participants may be unaware of it. And when awareness comes, they still may be unable to know or foresee where its changes lead. So too here. While we now may be coming to the realization that the cyber age is a revolution of historical proportions, we cannot fully appreciate yet its full dimensions and vast potential to alter how we think, express ourselves, and define who we want to be. This case is one of the first this court has taken to address the relationship between the First Amendment and the modern internet. As a result, the court must exercise extreme caution before suggesting that the First Amendment provides scant protection for access to vast networks in that medium. Simply put, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the First Amendment right to free speech protections extends to social media platforms. For those who don't see the connection, allow me to further break it down. The U.S. federal courts have previously held that hate speech is a form of protected free speech under the First Amendment. When taken in combination with the Packingham ruling, one could hypothetically argue that if YouTube censors, suspends, or bans channels for hate speech related reasons, they could potentially be in violation of users' civil rights because these social media companies are barring them from exercising their First Amendment constitutional rights to free speech in the digital public square. One could even hypothetically argue that this applies to videos YouTube places in restricted mode as well. Further, for purposes of our little thought experiment, a hypothetical argument could be made that males of all races and whites have been disproportionately targeted for deplatforming by Google. If this turns out to be true, 
then one might be able to argue that Google discriminates against whites and men of all races. In support of this hypothetical argument, one might bring up Google's trusted flagger program. You see, Google pays its trusted flaggers to essentially run their own pseudo botnet to independently target and astroturf mass flag videos and channels for censorship. What I mean by this is that Google has empowered each of its trusted flaggers with the power to, by themselves, mass flag down a video or a channel. The Southern Poverty Law Center is one such mass flagger. The SPLC lost all credibility in 2014 when the FBI cut ties with them and for their refusal to classify racist left-wing activist organization Antifa as a hate group. Additionally, when it comes to YouTube's demonetization bot, once appealed, many videos are remonetized. The concern here, though, is that content creator appeals from automated demonetization often take more than a week to be resolved. But why is this a concern? It's because most views for a video occur within the first week of release and then drastically drop off. Thus, in cases where a video was automatically demonetized, then remonetized, the content creators never get compensated for lost revenues from Google's admitted mistake. Therefore, an argument could be made that these content creators are suffering from irreparable damage in the form of lost ad revenues as a direct result of YouTube's admission they demonetized these videos by mistake and failed to compensate the content creators for the ad revenue they would have received had the videos remained untouched. Further, Google and YouTube could also be held accountable if they demonetize these videos to discriminate against whites or males of all races. And the final stop on this hypothetical thought experiment brings us back to the 2016 whistleblower lawsuit previously mentioned. This is the one that alleged Google's employment agreements expressly prohibit Google personnel from reporting illegal conduct and that Google employed internal spies to ensure compliance. Now, because this video is getting a bit long, I won't be citing the U.S. code, but rather I'll be using Wikipedia because the definition paraphrase is 18 U.S.C. 1512, close enough for purposes of this little thought experiment. For those that don't know, that's the law on witness tampering. You see, Wikipedia defines witness tampering as follows. Witness tampering is the act of attempting to alter or prevent the testimony of witnesses within criminal or civil proceedings. Laws regarding witness tampering also apply to proceedings before the U.S. Congress, executive departments, and administrative agencies. To be charged with witness tampering in the United States, the attempt to alter or prevent testimony is sufficient. There is no requirement that the intended obstruction of justice be completed. In other words, if Google enacted a spying program to prevent its employees from testifying in a civil or criminal proceeding, they could be potentially guilty of the crime of witness tampering, and those responsible for enacting and enforcing those illegal policies could go to prison. Thus, in any hypothetical lawsuit against Google, were I the attorney, I would be looking for evidence that Google created or implemented policies to prevent or alter Google employee testimony. If I found it, I would immediately move for sanctions in the civil action while reporting those involved and Google to the U.S. federal authorities for criminal investigation and prosecution. With that said, our discussion and hypothetical thought experiment regarding the legal controversies surrounding social media companies is at an end. And as a reminder, I'm not an attorney and nothing in this video should be misconstrued as legal advice or promoting any lawsuit of any organization discussed in this video. Those discussed in this video were included for the conversational and hypothetical purposes only. If you feel like you have a lawsuit against Google, YouTube, or anyone else, I encourage you to consult with a competent attorney. If you've enjoyed this video, found it educational or insightful, please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to hit the bell so you'll be notified when I upload new content. You can also support my work on Patreon. And in case I'm targeted by YouTube, I mirror all my content on BitChute and MGTOW.com. Further, you can always find me at MissAndryToday.com where you can contact me directly. In addition, you can direct message me on Gab or Minds.com. All the links are in the description. I'm DDJ, and this has been your dose of Misandry Today.